Hello, this is Paul Gastard, defence coach for Stade Francais Paris. Just letting you know that I will be on Murray Anderson's The Final Whistle podcast. I'm currently here in Paris, burning myself with 28 degrees heat with the Eiffel Tower over there somewhere. And welcome back to The Final Whistle, brought to you by the Rugby Connection podcast. Well, we're making history once again with our next guest. He is renowned for his defensive work, whether it's with Saracens, England national team, Benetton. He's in Stade Francais now, even dabbled in head coaching role at Quinn's, but he's tearing it up. He's well-respected everywhere he goes. It's Paul Gustard. Paul, thank you so much for coming on. How are you getting on? I'm good, mate. Uh, enjoying the sunshine, enjoying life in Paris. And uh, yeah, looking forward to having a conversation with you. I'm glad. Um, is it weird that you're getting to enjoy the sunshine in because you've obviously most of your career has been in in the UK, so you don't get the sunshine. <laughs> well, do, do you know, I, I grew up in Newcastle, not too far from you, so we didn't see much sun, we didn't see much warmth, and my ears can probably tell that the heat in the sun is not a good thing for my head. But uh, do you know what it is? It, it, it's a nice change. It's a nice change. I got used to it. I lived last year in Treviso, which is almost forty degrees, so kind of getting accustomed to this now. I love it. Just- just keep the sun sunshine. Don't don't come back for the rain. It's not worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. True. I do miss it though. I do miss I do miss the cold, mate. I quite like. I always end up wearing like vests and shorts everywhere because it's so alien to me in my DNA. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of miss I kind of miss a bit of the cold and and the freshness in the air. And uh, you miss home, right? You miss home, so you miss right, you yeah. miss obviously right. your friends and stuff, but also uh, you miss what home represents to you. And uh, I I certainly do that from time to time. But like I said. It's not been a bad year. I've really enjoyed my time in power so far. Yeah, I mean, you've been you've done well. You got to the playoffs. We're not going to talk about the result, but you you did well. You got there and you were in the fight. Um, first question that we actually ask all our guests: This, what actually got you into rugby in the first place? Well, as as a, as a player, um, you know, obviously from from Newcastle, we're, we're football mad, and um, my problem was I wasn't very good. So, uh, and people might argue I wasn't very good at rugby as well, by the way. But uh, for whatever reason, my uh, my dad kind of bucked the trend of people in Newcastle. I didn't really play football himself. And he was a rugby guy and his dad was a rugby guy. So I ended up uh, kind of following what he did because it was his passion. So he took me down to what is now Newcastle Falcons, what is then, sorry, what was then, Gosforth uh, Rugby Club. Uh, three incarnations of Newcastle Gosforth and so on to where it is now. But uh, I ended up playing from five, six. All my kind of friends that I went to school with and, and knocked around with, all their dads also played rugby. So we had a good group of six or seven of us and uh, we did the same things like you normally do with your mates. And that was it, man. I loved the game. I loved the contact. Um, I loved the camaraderie. Uh, and as time grew and, and as you got older, you understood the morals of the game and the values of the game, and the things that it gives you outside of just the, the, the game on the pitch. And I kind of fell in love with it, you know, and I can remember as a, as a small lad, um, fat lad, but a small lad, uh, with my dad watching, you know, the the highlights on on BBC on a Saturday or Sunday, uh, going down to watch him at every opportunity to play when he was playing or when he was coaching, and just loved the game, you know, as much as I like watching football, um, you know, rugby's, rugby's my number one passion. Love that, and I could he- I could hear how passionate you are, which is what I love because I I can talk about rugby all day every day. It's actually how this started because I think I was annoying my partner and parents too much about it so <laughs> well yeah I mean I, I guess doing what you do you have to love rugby right and talking to people like me you're gonna have to have something to talk about so you have to love the sport and be able to talk about it and it's all it's uh, idiosyncrasies and all its nuances and um, all the good things about the game as well and th- there's some things that need development there's some things that need improvement of course often I think as rugby we, we say the holy than now uh, perch uh, which isn't always the case with our sport but uh, I think for the most part it's a, it's a, it's a great game um, certainly off the field, the values, as, as I mentioned briefly before, I think the kind of friendships that you create uh, and the behaviours that you uh, manifest inside yourself due to, due to how the game is, is, is refereed, due to the respect you have for officials, due to the way you conduct yourself with the opposition. I think all these kind of things are, are, are like mediocre, sorry, mediocre, like small life lessons that mm. you pick up from a very early age that kind of get instilled in you. And, um, you know, here we are today. No, I couldn't agree more. Definitely couldn't agree more. Um, what got you into coaching then? Um, do you know what it is? I, I never, I never, 
really uh, had the ambition to be a coach where I am now today. And and often when I say that, people will kind of think it's a bit bizarre. But I suppose going through my journey of, of a rugby player, I was in that transitional period of amateur and professionalism. So I left school in 1994. Um, I'm not even sure if you were born then, but 1994, I left school. <laughs> I was at uh, university, I did law at university, and uh, I, I finished in 1997. And during that year, I happened to go, uh, the game turned pro in 96. I was with England 21s, I think, or England Colts, I can't remember which one I turned pro in. But we were wearing tour, and um, I was playing in a club called Bladen when I left school, uh, which is a, a small club in the north of England. Fantastic club, because what normally happens when you leave school is you can't play men's rugby mm. because there was enough men able to play. But as soon as the game became professional and there was wages, what actually happened is people weren't willing to leave a job to go and earn you know, next to nothing really as professional players. They were looking for all the kind of young talent in the area in Newcastle to try and um, you know uh, harvest and take back to the club. So it kind of, um, my journey kind of started, started from that in terms of as a player. And I saw myself as I uh, got into law, got into the city, doing something. And it was just kind of a conversation with Eddie Jones, who was the incoming coach at, uh, at Saracens. And he asked me, you know, if I, uh, well, one, he asked me if I was going to re-sign for the club. And at the time, it was kind of 50-50 whether I signed or, or moved on. And he had this opportunity as a coach, as a skills coach. And two ways of looking at it, I, Eddie either recruited me or signed me as a coach, or he re-signed me as a player. And I think probably the latter, I think he got rid of me as a player and took me on as a coach as a secondary thing. So it was kind of just uh, something that he asked me to do. I went away and did a project for him. And I kind of really got my teeth stuck into it. I'm quite process driven. Uh, I'm emotive and emotional, but but I kind of really enjoy process and uh, strategic thinking and, and planning and periodization. And I kind of got into this thing I did for Eddie over kind of a six week period. Uh, and that was it, really. I kind of got hooked into it. And uh, in my mind, I always thought I was going to be, you know, as I said, working in the city or doing something with my law degree. But coaching maybe kids on a Sunday morning, which is what I thought I would have enjoyed the most. But as it turns out, I am coaching kids. They're just bigger kids and, uh, you know, probably better kids. But, uh, yeah, it was never it was never my primary ambition to be a professional coach. Just kind of came my way through a conversation with Eddie. And um, as it turned out, I'm not too bad. You've done well. I mean, you've, you've kind of followed Eddie and got to the national team and you won back-to-back Six Nations. Does that ever sink in that? That you're part of that success. Yeah, look, uh, look, I, I, I think always as a coach, you're always privileged to work with who you work with, right? So I've been very fortunate that uh, at that period of Saracens, we went through a huge transitional period uh, of players uh, when Eddie left and uh, Edward Griffiths, um, who is often unspoken about in terms of Saracens uh, foundation, but he was kind of the real pioneer uh, along with Brendan uh, in terms of how the, the club changed, the recruitment strategy. Uh, the way people were treated, supported by the you know the fantastic Nigel Ray, and I think that kind of that that block there I was very lucky to get hold of the likes of Skull Brits and John Smith and uh, and players like that Ernst Jaber. Um, but on top of that, there was this class of two thousand and eight that came through the Jamie Georges, Owen Farrells, uh, George Cruz, James Short, Andy Saul, uh, Alex Good, and so on. And then after that, you know uh, the great Maratoji kind of pops up on your radar as well. So all these kind of players around and a lot of them then obviously went through in that England group. And um, I coached England in 2013 as well on the first ever series win in Argentina, which was an awesome experience. And then three years later, obviously, Eddie came knocking on the door and I was actually changing a nappy on one of my kids. And um, I kind of said, look, Eddie, I'm sorry, I keep missing you because my my kid was like running around trying to get uh, a nappy change. He went, well, look, now your country needs you, which is not a bad line. (laughs) It's not a bad line. And he said, Look, I'd, love you to, I'd love you to come and coach with me again. And um, with England, this is what we're looking to do. This is the plan. This is where we see you. This is a group I'm putting together. Uh, and this is what I think we can achieve. And, and that was it. So I kind of, you know, obviously delighted from, um, from a situation of, of making me feel proud and my family feel proud. But ultimately, it's due to the quality of the players that we had, uh, the environment that we were able to create, uh, their desire and their ambition to succeed and improve. And, um, you know, I was very lucky to be in a, a period uh, through Saracens, which is obviously still continuing now and, and, and kind of laying a foundation there with defence and some other characteristics. And then with England, it was fantastic. Even Harlequins, there was lots of good about Harlequins. I didn't end the way that I, that I anticipated, of course, um, but, I, but I'd already re-signed for somebody else. 
uh, and then Benton was amazing, and then Stad's been incredible as well. So look, I've, I've been really lucky. Um, you know, it's it's obviously uh, fortuitous to to fall into a club like Saracens, where you're already there as a skills coach, and then get offered a defence coach and forwards coach job, and so on. And I was in the right time at the right place, and um, you know that's sometimes how life works. I'm, I love that. That's almost took my, my words away from me there. Just how how well you spoke about it. Now, it's, it's in the newspapers time and time again that Eddie's quite hard to deal with. Now, you obviously know Eddie very personally. Is he hard to deal with or is it just the character? What's he actually like? He's, he's actually, he's actually you know, good fun to be here around. You know, he's great to go for a beer with. He loves sport. I absolutely loves rugby. You know, if you love rugby, um, then you're going to enjoy talking to this fella. You know, he's, he's very insightful. He's got a, an incredible eye for detail. Uh, incredible sense, you know, like they talk about, uh, you know, your gut, um, which which some people call your intuition, some people call thin slicing. If you read Martin Gladwell's books, but but kind of the idea is that he's anticipation about what he's seeing, and then the solution comes very fast, very 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 fast to him. And I think as a as a as a manager, he obviously has a certain way of dealing with people and uh, and trying to get the best out of people, which can be quite direct and forthright, but. He kind of doesn't waste time either. He kind of says what he wants to say and he says it to you, which I also respect because he doesn't muck around. You know, sometimes you want that challenge. You want to be you know, supported as well, of course, but you also need direction. And he's very good at giving that, um, you know, along with the RFU, obviously uh, the governing body. They also supported the development of the coaching staff. So we did a lot of things that really helped catapult us from being, you know, reasonable club coaches. Uh, to, 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 you know, good, I think, uh, international coaches. You know, I think my, my win percentage as an international coach is almost as high as anybody else in, in the history of the game uh, because I fell across a period that was very successful, of course. Um, so, look, I, I, I think that he gets a lot of um, criticism, which is, which is unfair at times, and also a lot of feedback potentially on the way that he's, he's dealt with some people because we all like something different, right? You know, and kind of... That's one of the things you need as a coach is to be able to adapt and um, speak to speak to one person one way, another person another way. Um, but for, for the main, for me, you know, I really enjoyed working with him. Uh, I think he developed my coaching exponentially in, in two and a half seasons, three seasons when I was there. I would have stayed on uh, for the World Cup, but for a family situation where I felt I couldn't, I couldn't stay there anymore, and uh, that was it. But look, I'd, I'd work with him again, and I, I don't think you can give any better credit or uh, answer to that question again, that no matter what people say about him, you see now Neil Hatley go to work with him again um, from Bath. Uh, you'll see S&C staff go and work with them, not just for the second time, the third time, the fourth time. So for yeah. all the doubters and the haters and the criticism, people that worked with him before still go back to work with him again. There you go. That's, that's all I wanted to know. Because obviously I don't know Eddie personally, so I, I take it from what you see is what you get. And I, I, I like that. But obviously, like you said, that he gets a lot of criticism, he gets a lot of stick. I'm like, yeah, but do you, does anyone actually know him? So, yeah, look, at, well, yeah. maybe he's what, maybe his wife, but we'll see. Um, they can kind, kind of <laughs> the, me, 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 and my wife actually. We have a we have a saying: the taller the tree, the stronger the wind. And I, I think that obviously Eddie at the top of uh, you know, um, particularly in England, the rugby and the foundation for rugby is so vast that the very pinnacle of the game is actually very small, as we know. Professional rugby is tiny compared to the grassroots of the game. And if you're the figurehead of this organisation in terms of a rugby uh, landscape, not the CEO and so on, yeah. and, you're very, and you're very vocal, you're very outspoken, um, you've enlisted change, significant change throughout the hierarchy at the top of English rugby, then you're going to draw um, words about you, good, bad, indifferent, and I think the one thing when we started off, we obviously equaled the world the world record for consecutive wins, uh, tying New Zealand with eighteen. Uh, unfortunately, losing to Ireland in the, in the second Grand Slam attempt. Um, but at the very start, everyone loved Eddie. All the journalists loved Eddie. And as time went on, I think that um, obviously that that kind of dissipated and diminished a little bit. But if you, again, if you look at Eddie's pure statistical record, it's 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 uncomparable to anybody else. You know, yeah. he is without doubt the most successful England coach we've ever had. And whatever we say, whatever said about him, you can never take that away from his performance as a coach because he did get us to a final. You know, yeah. he did get us to a final. Unfortunately, he didn't get the result that we wanted. But his track record at World Cups is incredible. And I'm okay. sure, and I'm absolutely sure, and I'm also frightened by it, 
that Australia will be a much, much um, more fierce animal this time around than they have been in the last couple of World Cups. A hundred percent agree. I think as soon as it was announced that Eddie Jones is signed with the Wallabies, I think everyone kind of just like, oh, that was a surprise, but also kind of went, oh, yeah. no, oh, no, here we go. Yeah, um, and look, look, he, he, he has grand ideas, right? I've spoken to him a few times, obviously, over the last kind of year or so, but um, there's lots of there's lots of plans he's got. You can see the shake-up he's already made with his backroom staff, you know, tailing a group to, to how he likes to work. Um, to understand them as well and, and the kind of outcomes that he wants, and objectives that he wants. Um, you know, I think the players will respond because often with change, you get response in, in immediately, be it right, be it wrong. You'll get a change in one direction because everyone sees this new landscape now where potentially they get an opportunity to play, uh, maybe a bigger role, uh, maybe more selection, maybe fearful of being dropped so they raise their performance, uh, big carrot of playing for Australia in the World Cup. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There's lots of reasons for positive change, and I think that you know we've seen over his uh, entire career that he's been able to to elicit this this positive response out of people and organisations in different countries. You know, yeah. did it with Australia initially, did it with Japan, he's done it with England, and I'm sure we'll see again with uh, with Australia in this next World Cup. I, again, I, I couldn't agree more. I'd love to get him on the show and feed off what you've just said to me and see what he replies with. Yeah, he, he probably won't do it for free though, mate. You probably have to pay him a bit, but <laughs> you can see. He can't come on then. I don't have the funds for that. <laughs> I don't have there any you, There you go. No, no. I'm not sure anyone has these funds, mate. Maybe there are a few. <laughs> Maybe there are a few. Maybe. We'll see. Um, as a defensive coach, what is the most important thing you look for from your defence? Whether it's Saracens, England, Benetton or San Francisco? I think I think wherever I've been, um, the most important thing is to develop a connection with the players. You know, whatever role it's that, that I've had is the most important thing is try and have the empathy with the players that they understand the message that you're trying to give. Um, you get a feel for for how they want to respond. If if I give you an example of of the Wolf Pack at, at, at Saracens, which you know is kind of lives on now and is branded everywhere and and all the rest of it, and it's become synonymous with the club. Is again, it was never a deliberate decision to say we're going to be the wolf pack. It was just the language and the storytelling I was doing at the time that a couple of players let out a wolf cry. And I kind of, you know, you listen, you see body language, you see people talking about it on the field and, and that kind of thing. I then went there, as it happens, my, my mum and dad own a, um, a, a sports promotional leisure work company in the northeast of England. If anyone wants to buy any kit or anything for their school, club, university, and so on. And um, I ordered some T-shirts straight away. So within three days, I had T-shirts which said uh, "Raised by Wolves." Raised by Wolves. I gave everyone a T-shirt, and we kind of moved on with that. So that the the most important thing I think was understanding what can work with the players that feels genuine, that feels authentic, and that you can have something that's bigger than just the game. If you look at sports like American football, they have a defensive a defensive team, a special teams, an attack team, and so on. Rugby league is a little bit similar as well. They'll have lefts, middles, edges. In rugby, we used to say forwards and backs, but you know, hopefully now the game's a little bit more uh, synergetic and integrated. So I wanted something that kind of like elevated itself above being part of Saracens. Uh, when I went to Harlequins, we 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 adopted the um, the essence of the Chicago Bears of '84. With England, it was an Englishman's home was his castle. So you know, we we defend it with your life. If someone comes into your home, then you're allowed to. Um, use reasonable force to get them back out of there. Uh, when I went to Benetton, the emblem's a lion. So we used lines and line speed and tents on your feet, next job spacing. Uh, at Paris for the Foreign Legion, you know, so kind of try and find something that works in each group that they kind of connect to and use two or three of them to bounce the idea off at times. And then sometimes you just got to put, you know, a, a flag in the sand, so to speak, and go like, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. And this is the standards that we must have. And um, I feel like if you have the players on board first and they kind of feel your energy, your positive energy, uh, your determination and drive, and then you can back it up with tactical acumen, then I think that's probably the key. It's too easy to sit here and go, it's staying square, it's spacing, it's mm -hmm. line speed, it's this, it's this. Like everyone says that, right? Every, every, every coach in the world talks about an attack of one three three one or one three two one one or... Two four two, or you know, chase the nine in the opposite twenty-two, or kicking percentages, or don't play in the fifteens, or whatever. Like we all say the same thing. Likewise in defence, 
stay square, watch the ball, uh, equal spacing, exponential spacing, uh, two in the tackle, two fold, uh, first one chop the legs, next one adjusting the ball. We all say the same stuff, right? And it, it's, it's repetitive, it's boring. So we try and, or I might try and bring it to life a little bit through animation, through metaphors, through analogies, uh, through stories, through soul, uh, and through personality. I love that. I, I would actually work for you. I would listen to you. You'd get me back on a rugby field just from okay. the way you're talking. So there you go. Okay. Can you tackle? I can tackle. Well, yeah. Then you've got a chance, mate. You've got a chance. Okay. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's it. Can't do much else, but I can, yeah, I can tackle. Mate, Jack Berger couldn't do much else, mate, but he was pretty good. There we go. I'll, I'll take that comparison. I love that. <laughs> um, You've obviously worked with some of the best players in recent memory. Who's the most impressive like athlete you've worked with? If you can name Ath- a few athletes, I, I, well, I, 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 yeah, that's a you know, no one's ever phrased a question to me like that. Who's the most impressive athlete, athletically in terms of athletic qualities, not just player, but athletic qualities? Is that what we're saying? Okay. We'll go for that as well, yeah. We'll okay, that okay. I'd say athletically, the player that I've coached that probably would show those things. I'll, I'll give you two or three because it's it's probably the easiest without overthinking it. That's Skull Brits, Skull Brits, without doubt, one of them. I mean, that guy was freaky, freakishly talented. Obviously, he could move laterally, forward, backwards. He was only about hundred kilos. Um, you know, his core skills were excellent. He could step off either foot, but also exceptionally powerful through contact. He was fast and he was fit. So he had all these kind of really exceptional athletic qualities. The only thing he couldn't do a lot of was jump because he was a midget. He, oh, he was short. <laughs> he was short. He was short. I take, I take back the word midget, but he was he was vertically challenged. Um, I would say Marcus Smith as an athlete is incredible. You know, again, very, very fit, uh, very fast, can use uh, both feet. Um, you know, in terms of how he could move and his endurance was exceptional. Chris Ashton, likewise, very fast, very fit. Um, Neil de Kock, the same. David Stretzel, uh, for different things, maybe didn't have the endurance, but again, as an athlete, the way he could move was incredible. So, athletically, those kind of guys, um, you probably know, I'm not mentioning many forwards there, but kind of because they're, they're some of the forwards be more in one direction, you know, whereas these guys could do a bit of everything. Yeah. Maratoji perhaps is the most athletic kind of forward and endurance based athlete that I've coached, but those are the guys with that. The best player, the best player probably I coach, I would say would be Owen Farrell, um, because there's nothing that kid can't do. There's nothing that kid can't do. And I absolutely love his mentality. I love his, his drive, his determination to improve every single day. Um, I love the fact that he uh, loves defence. I love the fact that he loves to attack. I love the fact he can galvanise people around him. I love the fact that whatever he says out of his mouth, he's willing to do himself. Um, on top of it, he's a good bloke. You know, he's a really, really good bloke. So I think there's lots of great players uh, that I've coached. Uh, George Ford would fall into that category as well. You know, exceptionally talented kid. Uh, again, spoke really well. Um, did things on the field that that you know he would always back up and deliver himself, but but Owen Farrell as a as a one off, if I had to put one name out there straight away, without thinking too much of us fifteen years of coaching, he'd be the first player that comes to my mind. That's fair, yeah. I've I've always rated Owen. I think just the way he operates, mostly at ten. I'm not a fan of the Farrell at twelve thing, but to their own I'd, I'd, at 10 and especially this season the way he controls especially on the attack it, you just kind of sit back and be like my god like you are really good at this and it doesn't even look like he's yeah. everything, which is a worrying bit it doesn't look like he's trying which is a scary thing <laughs> Well, look, he's, he's obviously, I mean, he's, he's the, the amount of man hours he's put invested in himself to, mm. to, to be the level he's at, right? He's had over 100 caps. He's on three British Lions tours, British and Irish Lions tours, sorry. Um, you know, he's played 220 games for Saracens. He's won X amount of premierships, X amount of Heineken Cups. 
uh, Grand Slams, uh, Lions Tours. Like the, the kid is a serial, serial winner. Yeah. And he's just turned 30, you know, like he's got more, more time amazing. on the clock. And he's played in, you know, two positions for England at, at 10 and 12. Without doubt, I think he's, he's you know, he's a 10. And he's, in his heart, he's a 10. He controls the game, you know, beautifully. Um, he's, a, he's a tremendous array of skills. He might not have the same style of attack as, say, Finn Russell or, or Romarcus, but he is incredible in terms of manipulating space, identifying space, communicating space, playing to space. And on top of that, the other side of the ball, which sometimes can be anywhere from 46 to 54% of the time, mm-hmm. is rock solid. You know, he, he drives the energy in defence, um, he drives the energy in kick chase, uh, he gives complete confidence to people on his inside and outside. Uh, he fronts up physically. Of course, we miss tackles. Everyone misses tackles. But for me, I couldn't care less. He's intent. He's drive to do it. He's drive to take the line forward. Um, I think inspires those around him and, and makes sure that the rest of people with him follow him. There we go. You've heard it here first. That, yeah, he's, he's just the like, top of the food chain, really. Yeah, look, he's he's one of he's one of England's handful of world class players, right? Like he's he's a genuine world class performer. I think he comes into conversation with with anybody really when they talk about who's who's a who's a current world fifteen player. You know, even if he's not in the team for some, he's been talked about, and yeah. there wouldn't be many there wouldn't be many that would be in that conversation. So I think I couldn't give him any higher praise than that. You know, there you go then. Now. What's the biggest difference you've learned from coaching in different countries? Because you've coached, obviously, in Italy, you're in France now, you've been in England, but doing that, you've also coached in three different leagues. Yeah. Well, I mean, the obvious one's language, of course. Of course. <laughs> you know, that's, 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 that's something. So, again, you've got to find ways to, to be able to communicate to people because as you're learning language and you know, I did a bit of French at school, but uh, as I mentioned before, I left school in 1994 and I think I stopped doing French at 1988, 1989. So it's been a long time. Um, I remember some, je me souviens un peu, but kind of like it's a long, long time ago, okay? So I can understand a lot more now, uh, je comprends plus, but uh, to speak it, to speak it, still taking a bit of time. It's not automatic in my head. I can understand, as I said, uh, a lot more. Uh, but that's taken time. So I have to find other ways to connect to people, first and foremost, to build relationships um, so we can get feedback and you know meaningful feedback. And I have to find a way to present. I have to find a way to instruct. I have to find a way to deliver. Um, you know, this year at, uh, at Stade Francais, we ended up finishing with, uh, I think, the second best event in the league from, from 11th last year. Um, you know, up till, up till four games ago, we had the best defence, but unfortunately, we conceded a few um, kick chase strides in the last couple of weeks. But we made a big stride. We made a big stride, you know, and uh, hopefully that gives us a good platform for next year to develop. But I think I think the challenges are always always around making connection with people, and uh, the, the the more that you have that, because ultimately as a, as a coach you're also a salesperson. You're yeah. trying to get as many people in there to do the same thing at the same time, all of the time. In attack, it's slightly different. You know, when I present attack, when I've coached attack at different teams and so on. I talk a little bit softer. I stand with my arms behind my back. I'm a little bit more reserved. I'm a little bit further back. I use more colourful language, um, more imaginative language. Um, I, I try and I include a bit more. Whereas when I'm coaching defence, uh, when I'm delivering, I'm a little bit more, you know, talking, a bit more determined, a bit more in your face, a bit more aggressive in my stance, a bit more aggressive when I walk around a room because I also want people to feel that kind of energy when it comes to something. Um, Generally, defence is a little bit easier to get that kind of group buy-in and, and um, uh, cohesion earlier than it is with attack because there's less to think about in general. And, and I deliberately try and play on that and use less things to try and uh, have the players thinking about, less cues to look for and try and get aligned to more common things because there's so much to think about in other aspects of the game, under fatigue, under duress, that I want defence to be a little bit more simple. Uh, and, and give clear principles of play where people can just follow them automatically. Amazing. I, I, you could do a TED Talk on your philosophy of defence. <laughs> I actually, I maybe could. I maybe could, you know. I think yeah. um, it's it's maybe in the pipeline, eh? Maybe in the pipeline. Never say never. That's it. 
going back just to your playing career, just for a brief, uh, just because it's been round the news this whole week, unfortunately, about London Irish, just what, what are your thoughts? Because obviously you're now away from it all, so yeah, that just it's tricky. Yeah, no, like we've got a we've got a London Irish old boys group, like everybody has on um, on WhatsApp. Uh, like a Saracens one as well, and Leicester one, and what what have you. But uh, yeah, everyone's got it. Eh? it. It's was a special club, like a really, really special club. It's a proper community feel, a proper family feel. You know, when I played there, they, they they had very little. You know, had very little. The old Sunbury was you know very base. Um, you know, the gym was very basic. Um, you know, the facilities were very basic. Um, you know, the team didn't have superstars potentially like the, the team I had at Leicester or the team that were, I was involved with at Saracens, you know, a couple of years later. But there was something special about that place. And we've got a lot of good friends that still work there now. And uh, obviously last year, the club made a good step up in terms of performance on the field as well. And it's just a, you know, really sad state of affairs when, you know, we've lost three clubs now, three clubs now in England over the last kind of 12 months. And, you know, in my case, obviously, London Irish was a club that I played for for four years. I captained them. Um, you know, I've got, so I've got a lot of very strong memories there, um, a lot of good friends there. And everyone's kind of, you know, gutted, devastated about what's happened. And, and obviously, it's, it's a bit blithe for me to say that because there's people there that have lost the job and people that are looking for employment. And there's more people immediately right now that, that are feeling that, uh, feeling that pinch and feeling that pain. Um, I would say, you know, obviously Mick Crossan, you know, who's who, who's the owner, and and I read some things, and he's under some criticism, which I find incredibly harsh because Mick Crossan is a is a is a great human being. Uh, he's a good man. He came into the club, invested a lot of money, his personal money, into a club um, when they were struggling, when they were really struggling, and he's allowed people to believe and dream and and, and do some wonderful things on the field. And obviously, at the moment, he's not in a position where he wants to sustain that investment, but. He has also been in that position for the last 12 months where he's been funding people. And, um, you know, I just, I just think it's easy uh, to throw stones sometimes at somebody when when they're in a position now where they, if they don't want to or can, can no longer continue investing his own money into something. He's tried to sell the club. Uh, they've tried to get other investments. And obviously, finally, now he's decided he's not in a position to do it. But um, I think, you know, a, a lot of people, a lot of people that know Mick would also be very thankful to Mick. Um, for, for the opportunities that they gave them as well. No, well, well said. I mean, I'm I'm personally not a London Irish fan, but they were always like a neutral. Like you'd kind of love watching them play just because uh, it was almost like back against the walls start, sort of style. Like you can never really write them off, even when they were really heavily down in defeats. And it was yeah, it, it just it sucks. It's, yeah, look, it, it, it's it's you know. Everyone loves the Irish, mate. Everyone loves the Irish, you know. Like they, um, it's it, it was a fantastic club. It's a fantastic club. It is a fantastic club, and hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, they've got a thriving amateur um, community there as well. And hopefully, they can find a way at Hazelwood to, to to allow that to continue to prosper. Uh, allow the community to use the facilities still, because it's not just uh, the pro team that use that, those fields and use the the, the complex that they built there. Um, you know, it's just it's just, it's just really sad. Look, you know, obviously at the moment the, the English game's struggling. Um, you could see the writing on the wall a few years ago, which was you know one of the reasons why I was looking abroad. Um, and it's it's tricky, you know. COVID obviously knocked the knocked the wind out of everyone's sales, you know, not just in sport, of course, but the top end of sport when you when you had no ticket sales coming in, you know, really, really felt the pinch. And if the TV money went, then then you know the premiership would would cease. It would cease. So there's a there's a big discussion around the the rugby model. I think in general, you know, if I was a Premiership coach, I want autonomy um, of the team that I'm in charge of uh, or coaching with. I want control of the players. If I'm the RFU, maybe I'm thinking different now. I think you know maybe we we see the blueprint from Ireland. We see we see people uh, maybe centrally contracted. Uh, maybe you know they invest something like forty million um, a year. They are a few into the top level of the game. And it used to be kind of 70 30 split between the top level and, and, and sorry, 50 50 split between the top and, and grassroots. Then it's been moving further and further away and more money going into the top level again. The championship has lost its funding, grassroots get less, where really it should be a little bit more equal because one of the, 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 the purposes, one of the uh, values of the RFU is to grow the game. And we have to find a way to do that. Maybe for England to prosper. Now, as a, as a, I suppose, an expat, you know, working overseas in a, in a thriving league like the Top Tours, 
is maybe maybe essentially contracts is the way to go. Sign up the best 30 players, give each of these 10 clubs three players each, take yeah. away some of the burden of financial costs in each club and trying to work it out. England then take control of their players. The, the clubs, I think, have to reduce their expectation on salary, you know, bring, bring the, um, the overall cap down. You know, they're talking next year to go back up to 6.25 million, but we've just seen another club go. You look at all the debt of all the clubs and it's, it's just, you know, not sustainable because it just takes one guy to walk away and go, I'm not doing this anymore and it's done. Yep. In France, you know, there's obviously lots of very wealthy owners as well. It's also massively supported by, by, by wealthy companies or businessmen. But also they have to show evidence of funds a year in advance. So they also have to make sure that the, the clubs can be sustainable. And I'm not saying it's perfect over here, um, but but the passion, the growth of the game is going like this, whereas the yeah. premiership's going like this. You know, yeah. you, you're seeing increasing crowds. Um, you know, La Rochelle, I've, I think, sold out 80 games in a row now, 80 games yeah. in a row uh, for, for a coastal town club that not so long ago were, were in, in the equivalent of the championship in Pro D2. Yeah. Um, you know, you're seeing these huge sellout games at, at Toulouse, uh, at, uh, at Bordeaux. We played in front of 32,000. In the Premiership, I think we sold out, I don't know, maybe 15 games over the course of the year. And, and the figures are, are bloated because of things like the big game or, or uh, Saracens taking the game to Tottenham Hotspur or, you know, whatever. It's all these kind of fixtures that make the, the actual attendances look a lot bigger than they actually are. And yeah. um, I think people are kind of becoming a little bit disillusioned. Um, which is a shame because the Premiership has a lot to go for it. My yeah. personal, my personal belief is they need to bring back promotion and relegation. But I understand from a business model again, there's there's some big problems with that. Um, but I think that that also doesn't help the national team when there's not that thing where people are fighting all the time for for success. And it sounds like I'm contradicting myself because obviously the URC there's no promotion and relegation, and mm-hmm. you know Ireland are pretty successful, but there's promotion and relegation in the top couturs and. You're seeing up to last week before the playoffs, there's things to play off to get into the top six, uh, in, into the bottom, uh, to get relegated and so on. And there's this kind of something, uh, context in each and every game that drives demand, that drives interest um, and also resilience, you know, for the, for the players, you know, where there's a need, need to fight and need to, a need to get the job done and need to perform. And, you know, ultimately you're seeing too many big blowouts of scores in the Premiership for my liking, you know, lots of 40 points, 50 points. I think it's only four teams or three teams had a positive points difference. And, yeah. um, you know, for me, that's not the direction that England as a rugby, as a rugby nation, as a, as a national team need for its foundation to be based like that. It needs stronger foundations where players are playing in an intense, um, driven environment where they need to be able to perform week in, week out to try and help the national team. Because, as I said, obviously now I'm an England fan with good friends in the England setup. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Sinfield came over to spend a few days with me and watch and, and see what I do. Uh, Steve, obviously, I've coached and worked with. He's a good friend of mine and lots of the backroom staff and the boys that are there. And I want them to do well. I want England to win the World Cup. And and that, for me, is is my interest now in, in English rugby. No, I, don't, I, I completely agree. Maybe not the England winning the World Cup part, but I agree with everything else you've said. But I do think, without going into too much detail, because we could talk about it all day, Something needs to be done. I I don't know what needs to be done. I have ideas in my head, but again, I'm not a businessman. I don't know the ins and outs. I don't know who's in the worst state, who's in the best state. I don't know all that, but like just from how I see it, I'm like, you need to do something, anything. Just come out with a statement of some sorts to give, I don't know, reassurance to fans. I don't yeah, know. look, I mean, yeah, I think, as you, as you said, people are kind of, you know, but one of our problems, again, is the league stops. The way the league is, the league stops a couple of times a year with, uh, you know, for different competitions and so on. And it is the same in the URC, but th- there's got to be something maybe even for the clubs where it's a bit more sustainable, a bit more constant. The competition is more clarity on it when you play a bit more clear. You know, if I, if I talk about a competition I'm coaching in now, you know, all the Freddie Durr teams, so the championship play Thursday and Friday night. Yeah. Then the schedule games on the Saturday leading to the, the, the big game, the, the biggest game of the weekend, the biggest two teams together on Sunday at nine o'clock. But before that, on Saturday, there's three, there's five, there's nine. Yeah. Um, and there's clarity. It's never Friday night. It's it's only Saturday, Sunday. Prodi Durr is always Friday night with one game on Thursday. 
Well, as obviously, and I understand the reasons why, because again, um, people share football stadiums and so on. So that yeah. there's different things, but the games are always at different times, different places. And I think, again, that creates a little bit of confusion for the consumer. Um, again, like you, I'm not a businessman, I'm a rugby coach. And, um, you know, that, that's that's where my passion is and what I like. But obviously, I want I want England to do well. You know, I want um, the national team to do well. I want to win World Cups. I want to see England lift the World Cup with my son. Um, I want my friends that are involved there to do well. Uh, and I want the players that are playing to do well. And um, I think that there's, as a model, as a model, maybe, you know, century contracts in these guys, if they spend 30 million or 40 million a year with the clubs, maybe they spend 25 to 30 million on the players, have the players have control over 40 players, give the clubs each a million each, maybe. And then, you know, if it's the same spend, but then they have the other players, give them each three. And then that maybe reduces the cap by 2 million each to each of the clubs. And then they operate on three and a half to four, uh, no marquees and, and see where it takes them. And it's, it's, it's difficult because it's not necessarily a forward step in yeah. terms of, are oh, we going to compete with these things? But maybe it's a necessary step and it's a way that you can try and function. You know, I, I, co- I coached in Benton last year and their, their entire spend was 4 million euros. Yeah, you know, it went a bit, it went a bit high with my salary, obviously, but there was a, a little bit more. But we, we're trying to, we're trying to, they're trying to find a way to to make things work, and they're competitive. You know, they didn't win again the year before I left there. We end up, you know, up till up till Christmas, we were sixth or seventh, and unfortunately, we lost twenty seven players to the national team, which was great because it was progress. But we didn't win a game for two months, you know, yeah. and then we just we just slipped down the league, and then we go on tour to South Africa for two games and don't get results there, you know, and eventually. Eventually, just dropped down the table to 10th or 11th when we finished. But, you know, again, make good progress. This year, they're making progress and they're spending half what the Premiership spend. And they'll give a lot of those teams, Premiership teams that go over to Benetton, you know, probably 75% of them will lose at Benetton. You know, mm-hmm. they, they, they've actually got something going there and they, and they spend less. They spend less. It's not always the money. It's the quality you get. And if the whole market comes down to a level, then someone that was on 100 now gets 60, then there's a constantness to it. And, and that maybe normalizes things. It means clubs and businesses can survive. Um, it means that there's no there's nowhere else for these players to go to either, by the way. There's GIF in France. That means you have to have a certain amount of French qualified players. Um, you know, overseas in the Southern Hemisphere, they try and lock it again because they need their players there. They're going to have to find a way to have the relaxed players going abroad a bit. And also, they're going to end up having to receive less money to do this job because I just can't see it being sustainable on its current, on its current path. No, I, again, I completely agree with every word you've said there, Paul. Um, I'm going to go into something. I was going to catch you off there with two quick fire questions just before we go into a bit something different. Is there any players that you still like to work with that you haven't had the chance to work with yet? Oh, that's a great question. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's loads probably. <laughs> there's loads. Look, I, t- I tell you, a couple of players that I think are, are just genuinely like I, I watch them and go, wow. Yeah. Um, so there's there's um, Cross who, who plays plays it for France, mm-hmm. um, incredible player. Uh, reminds me a lot of like Richard Hill actually, who's, who's one of my all time greats for for English rugby. Uh, it's the back row, not the nine. The nine was very good, by the way. Sorry, Hill, if you if you ever hear this, <laughs> but but the the back row, Richard Hill was incredible. Um, I love Will Jordan from New Zealand. I love Ari Salve from New Zealand. Um, gosh, I'll keep going on. Damien Pinot, I think, is an incredible player. You know, there's there's too many there's too many to mention. You know, uh, I think I think with rugby, the nice thing is um, there's always next week. Or for, for me, there's always next week. You know, and and the opportunity to compete and to perform is there. But the most important thing is the group that I have right now, and um, you know the, the the possibilities with this group that I've got. I like that. I was gonna I was gonna try and ask you one, but I don't want to get you into trouble. So I'll ask you it off there. It's fine. Okay. Well you can always ask me and I could just uh, you know walk, talk around it or just ignore it. Okay. Um is there any teams or leagues that you'd still be interested in working in? Um yeah, look to do it is I I I going back a few years ago. So the the when I was at Harlequins, obviously the whole thing with COVID, so it was a difficult time because the first year I joined, I think we finished second last. Um, and I joined in, the, in that summer and we finished joint fourth. We finished joint fourth. Uh, we missed out on uh, points difference or uh, to, to, to go into the top four. Uh, we mm-hmm. missed a kick, last kick of the game against uh, Wasps away, okay? Next year we got to the Prem Cup final, but it was during uh, COVID. 
So the rugby stopped around February. We had COVID, we had rugby restart, we had COVID uh, mark two. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, going through the entire thing, it was like, I I'm going to need to coach abroad. I need to make sure that I can uh, safeguard my, my, my family. We've taken pay cuts, et cetera, like everybody was. Uh, mm -hmm. You got on furlough and all these kind of things. So my ambition was always to coach abroad somewhere. I looked into a few things, had some opportunities to coach in the Southern Hemisphere, um, some super rugby teams, some national, international teams, a few teams in France, some other teams in England. But uh, the one that kind of I felt a connection to was, was Benetton, bizarrely. And, and all the things added up in terms of the overall package. I generally say for rugby, it's ambition, lifestyle, remuneration. Those are the three things that you move for. Uh, ambition can be where you're coaching, who you're coaching with, and so on. Lifestyle, where you live, who you live with. Um, the area that you live in, and then remuneration is obviously money. And everyone has a different weight to all those three things where you are in your life. But the one club that, or the one place I was thinking about was Japan at the time. And um, the stars didn't quite align with the opportunity that I had there. I would love to do Japan at some stage, maybe, but I think my wife wouldn't like to do that. And um, I wouldn't mind coaching the Southern Hemisphere, but probably that third thing we spoke about, remuneration, um, yeah. isn't. Isn't too isn't too great compared to some of the opportunities that have presented themselves. So, for the here and now, I'm really happy. I just signed an extension for for three more years at Stad, oh and um, you know Paris obviously an amazing city. Um, loads of things to do, uh, incredible opportunity. Um, you know, lots of work to be done on the rugby side of things for sure. We you know we've got a some some big big mountains to climb against some of the teams that we face against. You know, we don't necessarily have on paper the strongest squad. We have one guy that'll go away with France probably compared to say to lose out of 12. So, you know, we're, we're a long way behind the likes of them in La Rochelle at the moment. Um, and as of to us, try and coach better, uh, create a strong environment, draw more players in. You know, it's fortunate to have a good relationship with Joe Marchant, obviously from Harlequins. And, yeah. uh, you know, spoke to him a lot when he was looking around. Spoke to a few other players in England that I've coached that were keen to get over here. But, um, you know, probably because, of, again, the GIF and the amount of foreigners that they can have was going to quite work out. But uh, really excited to work with March. We signed Brad Weber from New Zealand next year as well. So a couple of really high quality individuals coming to the club. Yeah, it's going to, it's going to be exciting. I've always had Stad from saying like part of the or Stad Paris is or none now, is it is that well we just call it Paris now really but um, for me it's always been Stad because it was always Stade Francais. Like when I was a yeah. kid growing up with the biggest club was Stade Francais when it's at Leicester we played a high cup final against Stade Francais the Parc de France where uh, Paris Saint Germain played. And it's literally over the road from our stadium, Jean Brown. So you yeah. I mean, you've got Roland Garros, you know, the three of them all in a row. It's like Melbourne, where all the all the stadiums are together. And it was the biggest club. They've won 14 Charles Brunusa, 14 premierships in the history, you know. Yeah. And and over the my first few years of playing professional rugby, they won four titles, uh, premierships, the same as Leicester did. So it was yeah. always the club that was the most um in form at my time. So in my head. It was always the club that we had to beat. And, you know, as you're wearing now that shirt, I can see now, it's it's kind of like a club that was also a pioneer in many, many ways in terms of off-field, in terms of integration, commercialization, in terms of bringing family to places, uh, incorporating uh, other communities. Um, it was kind of definitely one club for all. So it's, mm. it's a huge club. It's a huge club. And since kind of then, they have won a title since then. They have won a, a, a European but kind of never been that constant kind of performer. You know, uh, this this year we finished fourth, which is the first time uh, they finished uh, above sixth in the last 14 years. And we only finished in the top six twice other than, other than that. So it's been really meager kind of times. And it, it's something that we need to address, you know. We need to be more competitive on a weekly basis. Uh, I've got two new coaches coming in. The entire coaching staff's kind of gone apart from me. Um, I've got two new coaches coming in from, from the France national team. Um, you know, really excited to work with them as well. As sad as it is to see the coaches that go, of course. Um, you know, Gonzalo Casado, you know, a, a really good, warm human being. And, um, you know, it'd be a shame for him to go. But Lauren Labitte and Kareem Gazal, two very highly rated coaches, uh, lots of conversations with them. I'm going to be head coach until they arrive, which is, again, you know, you know exciting. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to that as well. There we go. Well, all the best, of course, for, for one thing. And do you, are you just used to wear pink now? Have you just accepted that you have to wear pink everywhere for Paris? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I don't mind pink, man. It makes my eyes go pop. I'm, I'm okay with that. It's, um, you know, what I say, la, la vie en rose, la vie en rose. Life is, life, is, life is pink, life is pink. So, 
look, it's 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 bright. You know, when you go to the stadium, it's bright. There's no there's no doubting it. And that kind of stadium downstairs in the uh, in the bowels of the stadium, if you like, half it is all painted pink everywhere, and half mm. it is painted blue. So the home side is, uh, you know, you, you'll see all these lights and flashing lights and stuff, but pink is everywhere, Absolutely. and it's 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 you know identifiable, right? You can kind of everyone knows and sees and knows who we are. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and obviously, you know, if, you, if I was at Leicester Tigers and I was wearing pink, people would say you better play well, son. So it's uh, it's not a bad thing either. Fair, fair enough. I mean, even my mum knows that, like Stadford say or, or Paris, as they're known now, just because of the pink. I'll, I'll, That's it. I'll, I'll just show her a top and she's like, "Was that Stadford say?" I was like, "Yeah." How'd you get that? She went, just because of the pink. She was like, "Cause." I was like, "Okay, fair enough." Like, there you there go. You go. That's 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 uh, number one for branding, right? There we go. Number yeah, exactly. Even, yeah, exactly. Couldn't agree more. We're going to move on to something a little bit different, and it's getting to know you as a person. So, kind of away from all the rugby. Yep. Favorite film? Um, I don't get to watch too many nowadays. I've got three young kids, so my mind's kind of stuck with like Wonder Park and Finding Nemo and stuff. But uh, <laughs> what my favorite film be? Uh, one of them one of them would be probably Shawshank Redemption I reckon I think uh, I, I really enjoyed that um, I love the Lord of the Rings movies and probably I mean that's probably staying a lot because I can't think of many films I've seen since then so <laughs> probably probably most most things I watch now I probably watch Netflix documentaries on things probably more than more than films well that, that was actually the next one is there anything you're currently binge watching that you recommend for others to uh, yeah, I probably probably don't binge watch so much these days, but uh, you know things things if I get an hour or so here or there um, outside of trying to learn French, I'm kind of I would watch uh, there's the Coach's Playbook for Life that's on Netflix at the moment with Jose Mourinho, um, uh, Doc Rivers, you know, people, people, people like that, which is which is great watch. I watch all those kind of Drive to Survive and those kind of things. I think are really cool. Um, but yeah, so something around sports generally, or documentary on on something where I feel I can learn something. That's kind of what I, what I would watch most. Fair enough, I like that. If there was a film on your career or in your life, who would you have play Paul Gustard? Jason Statham. <laughs> nice, I like that. Like that. <laughs> only, only because only because uh, for for a first time coaching it, uh, it stars as used to call me Turkish from from one of the films because. Um, obviously, had a similar hairline, I think. <laughs> I like that. And that's the first time we've actually had Jason Statham as an answer as well. So, there you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Favorite song or music genre? Ooh, it's a great question. Uh, I would say kind of indie folk would be kind of my music genre. As a song, there's too many to mention. You could probably mention 10 Oasis songs. I probably could say one of those. Uh, my wedding song was actually um, Hey Ho by the Lumineers, uh, okay. which, which, is, which was cool. Um, yeah, probably, I mean, to nail one song, I'd say tough. I do really like The Hurricane by Bob Dylan. I think it's a, an amazing piece of music. Um, but kind of most Oasis stuff, The Verve, Richard Ashcroft, Still probably listen to that as much as anything else, Mumford and Sons, that kind of stuff. Nice, I like that. Nice variety as well. So, so. I think so. Well, actually, it, you know, it's, it's one of your brethren. I'd say Jerry Cinnamon as well would be one of the more recent ones that I really enjoy. Yeah, Jerry Cinnamon. Been lucky enough to see it. My, my variety is a bit more bizarre because I go from like Jerry Cinnamon to like Oasis, like you mentioned. I like Shania Twain. Yeah, just all of it. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, maybe you should admit that one on air, but okay. I've said it too many times now. I'm just diving <laughs> in. I'm just all, just all uh, um, F, no, not F. Favourite uh, food cuisine, style food? Uh, Italian. Nice. Italian. Solid. Ha having, having, lived, having lived there last year, the... I would say like it's it's one of the places where you can go and have something from a from a from a basic kind of restaurant and the quality would be exceptional. Yeah. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to pay a lot of money for it, but the quality is exceptional. And and particularly where I where I lived in northern Italy, uh, not too far from Venice, the kind of 
the, the fish and stuff that I had there was just exceptional. Very, very simple, very, very basic, but the, the quality of it and how it was cooked and the flavoring was, was, was immeasurable. It was incredible. Love that. Favourite pizza topping? Ooh. Um, what can I say there? Burrata. It's like a type of mozzarella. Okay, okay, cool. That's fine. No, because usually when we get to food, this is where the friendship breaks down. Because everyone, right, okay. like, everyone likes fish, and I don't like seafood. And people no. like pineapple and pizza. And, uh, no. no. No, I don't like fish on pizza. I don't like pineapple on pizza. Um, no, no, not fish I, on pizza, I, just seafood in general, not a yeah. seafood. Oh, oh, really? Okay, okay. okay. No, I like seafood. I just don't like seafood and pizza. <laughs> um, dream holiday destination um, again do you know I don't, I don't really think about these kind of things uh, I kind of anywhere my wife says wherever she wants to go I'll be happy what did they say wherever, you, wherever, you, uh, wherever your heart is is your home right so wherever she wants to go I'm happy but I, I kind of prefer personally I prefer personally go to like city breaks and oh. Places where I can see something, explore something, uh, try something new, than going somewhere where it's like just sitting on a beach uh, or something. I'd rather do something active or do something where I feel I take something away from that experience or, um, yeah, I get to learn something. I'd I'd rather that than just go and sit on on a nice beach somewhere. Fair enough. Nothing wrong with that. Any hobbies away from rugby? Uh, yes. I mean, I don't get to do it a lot anymore, unfortunately, but, you know, I do enjoy golf, cricket, uh, most sports, really, most sports. Um, what else would I say I like doing? I actually like riding my bike, eh? I used to, I used to run a lot, uh, but now I find my knee keeps swelling up, my ankle keeps swelling up, rugby's kind of caught up with me now, my lower, my lower limbs, Mm -hmm. uh, which was, ironically, despite not having big legs, was never a problem for me when I played, but now it seems to be they keep swelling up, my joints keep swelling up. So, yeah, I'd say I, I enjoy cycling, particularly now with my kids as well. I, I quite like going away for somewhere with them. Um, I still like lifting weights. Uh, I like listening to music. And uh, other than that, I like socialising. So, any of those. Happy days. Love all that. Your go-to post-match drink. Big win. And I don't mean like protein shakes or water or anything like that. I mean the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> well, first drink's always a beer. Whatever. First drink's always a beer. Win or lose, I have a, I have a beer. I kind of, it's the first thing I always have when we finish. We've got a, we've got a, a bar pump in our, in our room just next to the changing room. So nice. there's, always a, there's always a keg of beer there for the players. So always have a beer with the coaches there. Quick chat about the game. Um, if we win, we might have a few more. Sometimes <laughs> if, we lo- if we lose, we might have a few more as well. If not, obviously, having lived in Italy, a spritz of some sort would be quite high on my agenda now as well. Aperol is obviously the one that's most common, but they do all sorts of different ones. Campari, uh, Meza Meza, which is like a mix between Campari and Aperol. Select. Here we have Saint-Germain Spritz, which is like an elderflower cordial. Something like that sounds a bit sweet, um, but kind of like a spritz of some sort. Normally Meza Meza, which the Campari is quite bitter. I would say I quite enjoy that. Nice. Or gin and tonic. Or gin and tonic. Gin and tonic. Any kind of gin or just straight gin? Uh, uh, just a just a just a normal gin. I mean, I've probably got yeah, probably about ten or twelve different types of gin here. But uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not too I'm not too fussy, man. From Newcastle, fair enough. <laughs> Doesn't like that. What was the worst subject you did at school? French. <laughs> Funny enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually dropped French to do extra maths, so I ended up doing three maths at GCSE. I did maths, advanced maths, and statistics. So I kind of had a different, my brain was working in a different way than I did economics at A-level. So I kind of did something different uh, to, to, to languages. Um, so yeah, I'm finding this a little bit tougher. Fair enough. I was going to say, what was your best subject at school? Uh, history. Nice. I, I quite like history as well. Yeah, just was... teacher, right? I think, I think, like we mentioned before, the connection with the teacher is so important. I did uh, economics, I love the teacher. History, I love the teacher. Um, and obviously history it kind of kind of changes so much you know different different periods obviously lend itself to things of different interest and sometimes you find an area or a period of history 
that's fascinating. They can really visualize and, and see and, and, and kind of feel. And the emotion of the teacher, I think, helps get you into that as well. So I kind of think history, I really enjoyed. And then secondary to that would have been would have been economics. I enjoyed that as well because the teacher was great. Fair enough. I like that. Good answers. The most famous contact in your phone? Ooh. You can't uh, say me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, rugby-wise, rugby-wise, I'd say would be well obviously eddie steve andy farrell i suppose they'll all be quite big scott wise mantle a few i've got a few super rugby kiwi coaches i try and think I'm trying to think who i have on the phone um quite a few of the players still like well i'm not sure he's the most famous but he's definitely the most entertaining joe marler nice yes I'm looking for. I'm looking forward to getting Matt England to see him for a beer as well. He owes me a beer, so I'm looking forward to seeing him. There we go. Well, hopefully you get that very very soon. Final question for you today, Paul. Yeah. One thing you'd like to be remembered for. Caring. Like that. Like that. Caring. Caring. Yeah. I think um, my my instinct is to help, and mm -hmm. I think that if there's one thing that people walk away going, you know, look. You know, he, he understood what I was, you know, he understood what he was trying to coach. Um, did, he did it in a way that inspired me and so on. Great. But normally the the messages that I've had, wherever I've been while still at the club or left the club or something, have always been around the one that resonated the most is the connection you made with somebody. And it generally comes around to something that I did to help them. Um, that probably gives me the, the, the biggest kind of reward. I love that. And... I like that you make a good connection with everyone and you're on the Rugby Connection podcast. So just, it, it all winks itself and the book is now closed because you, you absolutely go. smashed it. And I cannot thank okay. you enough for agreeing to come on. No problem at all. No problem at all. It's been good timing because in 10 minutes I've got a French lesson, so it's awesome. Okay. There we go. We'll round it up there. This has been the final whistle with Paul Gustard and we will see you next time.